Boa tarde, outra vez. Um, isto está a ficar mais composto e animado e, e estas discussões são, são profícuas porque também é importante percebermos esta, estas diferentes perspectivas que temos sobre a nossa profissão. Este é um dos nossos objetivos, é justamente termos esta oportunidade de estarmos juntos e, e discutir uh, estas questões sobre aquilo que são as potencialidades e as limitações da nossa, nossa profissão, portanto eu espero que esta conversa continue uh, ao longo destes três dias, porque de certeza que vamos sair daqui todos mais, mais esclarecidos e até eventualmente a pensar em questões que não, não tínhamos colocado uh, a nós próprios enquanto profissionais, ou até mesmo enquanto, enquanto estudantes. Um, é com grande prazer que vos apresento a, vos, uh, a nossa próxima a portanto, uh, comunicadora um, chama-se Dembi Kim um, vem dos Estados Unidos está neste momento a fazer uh, o programa internacional de doutoramento na Fundação Champalimão em Lisboa começou a sua formação uh, já na área das neurociências uh, em, concretamente na área do cérebro e ciências cognitivas no MIT e um, tem três áreas três interesses de investigação que quando eu tomei conhecimento deles foi quando eu disse eu tenho que convidar esta pessoa para estar no nosso congresso uh, internacional um, e, e este convite foi feito e foi imediatamente aceito um, ela está muito contente por estar aqui e por partilhar uh, o, o conhecimento dela connosco e por aprender um, eu tenho que vos contar que a reação, a reação dela quando eu lhe expliquei o que era a psicometricidade e o que é que fazíamos como psicometricistas ela disse essa profissão existe, é que isto é o que eu ando a tentar explicar aos meus colegas da neurociência que é possível fazer. E nós sim, nós existimos, em Portugal somos mil. A sério? Portanto, isto é um encontro aqui que me parece muito, muito interessante. E, portanto, o que é que ela estuda? Estuda a adaptação cognitiva transversal às várias espécies do reino animal, que eu acho que isto é muito interessante, aquilo que é semelhante e diferente nas várias espécies, o comportamento motor como um, reflexo ou como manifestação do pensamento, portanto, se isto não é psicometricidade, não sei o que é, e um, outra coisa que me parece também muito importante, que são métodos não invasivos de, de investigação em neurociências, que é, no fundo, aquilo que nos permite uh, investigar com outras espécies, mas depois logo, imediatamente, poder replicar um, e tirar conclusões para o ser humano e portanto isto acelera em muito os resultados ou aquilo que nós depois podemos ver na prática ou levar para a nossa prática profissional aquilo que muitas vezes nós dizemos ah isto agora daqui a 10 anos é que se vai ver o resultado com esta comparação conseguimos ter resultados bastante mais, mais próximos e em tempo útil e, e portanto deixo-vos uh, a Dembi nos próximos minutos ela queria começar por fazer uma proposta muito psicomotora que acho muito curioso vir de uma pessoa que não é psicometricista, mas que me chamou a atenção para isto há um minuto ou dois, portanto, vou-vos deixar com uma proposta antes da comunicação. You can... Ah, ok, ok, ok. Uh, uh, thank you, um, thank you so much, Cristina, for inviting me here, and actually, since you guys have been such a wonderful audience for a whole hour, I suggested that maybe we could all take a quick stretch break since it is a psychomotricity conference. <laughs> Everyone should stand up um, and, and just stretch a bit and, you know, move around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so, um, yeah, feel free to, to stand as long as you can hear me. Um, sorry that I'm, I'm not speaking in Portuguese. My Portuguese is not quite that good yet. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I didn't even know what psychomotricity was until I met Christina and talked to her about it, and it's actually been incredibly inspiring, um, and I'm so happy that <laughs> I learned about this field. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited for this weekend to make many new uh, connections and meet all of you and to have even more inspiring interactions because right now in, in neuroscience there's actually a great need for collaborations with fields like yours, with, with fields like psychomotricity. Um, and I'll get into that more in just a bit. Uh, but I think 
uh, we can all agree that uh, we're, we're all basically interested in, in this question. What can we learn about brains by studying the movements of bodies? And um, neuroscience is a very large field and uh, similar to um, the discussion that was going on earlier, sometimes it's hard to know what exactly are we doing as neuroscientists. Um, but me specifically, I am very interested in understanding behavior, and in order to understand behavior, we need tools for studying uh, movements. And so I'm hoping to get some ideas from you guys as well. Uh, so. Okay. So um, in neuroscience, when we study what brains do, or when we study the function of brains, we refer to this as cognition. And traditionally, cognition is uh, focused on things like memory, attention, introspection, all things that are supposedly inside our heads and we can't see them. Uh, then, uh, more recently, there was a term that became popular called embodied cognition. And in neuroscience, this became a big deal in, in the 1990s, where uh, we started to acknowledge that the cognitive process, the thinking process that goes on inside of a brain, is going to be heavily influenced by the body that houses the brain. So different eyes, different noses, different ears, different abilities to sense the world will bring different information to the brain. And then once all the thinking is done, in order to do something about the thinking that you have just done, it all depends on, again, the body that you have. So embodied cognition was the first step in neuroscience to acknowledge this connection between the brain and the body. And so now I've learned about this new term, uh, even better, psychomotricity, which takes it a step further and says it's not only an, an important influence, but the brain and the body are essential to each other and emerging between their interaction is cognition or thought. Um, and I really, I really love this, this uh, term, and I really love this new definition. It really ties together a lot of things that I have always been excited about in my own research. And so I just want to define even more, perhaps broadly, that the movements of the body from the microscopic scale, so uh, one of the previous speakers talked about the molecular level and the cellular level, all of that, all the way up to full bodies, or even superorganisms like a, a musical band or a university or all of human society. All of those movements from a millisecond scale to the whole lifetime, these are all fundamental to the development of thought. And then in turn, the, the basic function of the brain is to generate movements and to control the movements of the body. Uh, so, even though psychomotricity is, is fairly new, especially to those of us in neuroscience, if we look back at all of the techniques that neuroscience uses, you'll notice that every time we are measuring movement of some kind, we are either measuring the movement of molecules, the movement of ions and nutrients, or cellular structures, um, and all the way up to, you know, again, full organisms. And if you see up there, just in that one corner, you see behavior. Um, but it's actually, it's actually huge, right? There's so much to be said about behavior. And so I want us to focus on that upper right-hand corner. OK, so um, a really wonderful evolutionary example of this fundamental connection between movement and thought is a sea creature called the tunicate, or they're called sea squirts. I don't, I don't know what they're called in Portuguese. Um, but when they're first born, they're, uh, they have a very basic nervous system. And so you can see right here, they have uh, what is called a notochord or a dorsal nerve cord. It's very similar to our spinal cord. And they use this basic nervous system to swim around the ocean looking for the perfect piece of coral or hunk of rock to settle on for the rest of their life. Uh, and then once it does find the perfect spot, the larva takes root and it completes its metamorphosis into an adult. And this process involves digesting most of its nervous system. It eats almost all of its nervous system. 
And all that's left is this small cluster of nerves here. And that controls the, um, the intake of water and nutrients and the output of waste. So once again, it is still connected to movement. So from an evolutionary standpoint, it seems pretty obvious to consider thinking and movement as equal parts of one system that allows the brain to navigate and manipulate its environment. So in a way, you could say that the, uh, the body is the brain's user interface for the world. Um, so a, an animal that really takes this idea into, I think, incredible, in, into an incredible realm is uh, cuttlefish, or uh, as you say here, lulash. Um, so I became fascinated with cuttlefish, and this is why I decided to pursue a PhD, um, because I saw that their peripheral nervous system, like in humans, controls their outer appearance. But their bodies are so flexible, as you can see here, they'll change not only the color and the pattern on their skin, but they can also change the texture and become you know, smooth or bumpy. And so I became excited about these creatures because I thought maybe their appearance would reflect their mental internal state. Uh, and maybe I could then study their brains without having to you know, hold them still or cut them open, that I could actually see them moving naturally and yet still be able to get some sense of what their brains might be doing. So um, something that many people have observed in, in cuttlefish is that sometimes they use their camouflage not just to hide but also to hunt, so they use it actively. Um, and so here you see a cuttlefish that is hunting a crab and a, a crab has you know, these claws that can pinch the very soft body of a cuttlefish and so it has to catch the crab at a very specific angle. So when the prey is this challenging, the cuttlefish will put on this strobing, flashing display in order to try and stun um, the, the animal that it's hunting. Oh. And so, um, in, currently in the field of marine biology, there's, this, uh, there's an ethogram, so there's a diagram describing the bodily changes as it centers around the moment of catching food. And so before it catches the food, it uses its camouflage to sneak up on whatever it's hunting, and then in the moments right before it tries to catch it, if the prey is dangerous enough or challenging enough, it uses this very you know, incredible display to, to stun or mesmerize uh, the animal. And then afterwards, after it catches the prey, there's a similar sort of uh, short, very flashy, incredible display, and then it goes back to its normal camouflage. And originally, the question I wanted to answer was, what is this, this signal that happens immediately after it catches its food? Because the best explanation that currently exists is that maybe it's a threatening signal to any predators that might be coming for the cuttlefish. But this, didn't really this wasn't very satisfactory to me, and so this is what drove me to say, I want to study this, and I want to design an experiment to look at this. And this all had to do with wanting to understand what the brain is doing in that moment, and I wanted to know, could I understand what it's thinking, what the cuttlefish is thinking right after it catches its food, just by looking at that very bright, flashy, special signal? So, I'm going to come back to this question a little bit in a little bit when I talk to you more about the research that I do and that my lab does. But I want to go back to the idea of bodies being interfaces for brains. So bodies are how we move through the world and how we manipulate the world. And in humans, we have gotten very good at using our bodies to, to move. And we can train ourselves to do things like uh, do complicated dances through choreography. Um, we also can move our bodies to generate music, uh, especially, thank you, <laughs> um, especially music in large groups. So this is the steel drum orchestra competition that happens in Trinidad every year, leading up to Carnival. And there are, in each group, there's up to 100 people who are coordinating their movements in order to make this incredible music. 
Uh, and then my last example is something maybe a little more familiar to everyone. We also can use tools. And for instance, we can get very good at doing things like flipping an egg without a spatula. Um, this isn't something that anyone can do right away, but with a little bit of practice, most people can, can pull this off. Um, so these are all activities that anyone can master just by drilling it over and over again. And in neuroscience, we actually do have a whole body of literature that talks about the effects of practice on the brain and how practice can actually physically change the brain. So even very simple movements like running on an exercise wheel can cause these changes. And so in this study, uh, there were two groups of mice. One mice got an exercise wheel and they could run all day. And then the other mice didn't get an exercise wheel and they just sat around in their cages. And after four weeks, their brains were stained to look for the generation of new cells. So in the first column, the black and white photos, all of the black dots, those are new cells that have been generated in the brain. Similarly, in that middle column, the orange labeled cells are the ones that have been, um, have survived long enough to specialize into uh, very specific brain cells. So they were also wondering, sure, maybe you generate a lot of cells, but do they actually last? Do they survive? And they found that they do. And then this, the last column is, again, another way of looking for cells that have been generated within a certain time period. And um, you can see that in the, in the bottom picture, more neurons were generated in the runners during the course of the four weeks while they were doing this study. Uh, so that's really great. It's really awesome to be able to uh, see how practice can change our brain. But sometimes there are moments in life where you can never practice for it. And the world changes so quickly that you just have to do something and you have to make that action happen. Okay, so I'm sure that you can think of some examples of moments like this. Uh, in English, we talk about these moments as times where you don't have time to think and you just have to do something. Um, but in a little bit, I'm going to argue that actually these are moments that require a lot of thinking. Okay, but I just want to um, lay down some terms that I have made up for this conference, uh, which is that when we have these moments where there's a sudden change or an unexpected event in the world and we have to respond, I would like to call that a rapid psychomotor response or reposta psicomotura rapida. So here you can see a, a skier is skiing down a mountain and there's an avalanche and he has to do something. And you can see the moment, actually it's about to come up now, where you see, oh, and then he's safe. Okay, so another moment like this is this man is walking down the street and all of a sudden there's a car. And uh, he didn't have much time and he just had to do something, right? But I want you to notice that he never really goes that far away from the sidewalk, right? Because he knows that there's more traffic here and he immediately comes back. He doesn't ever even stop walking. He just keeps going, just keeps going. Um, and then this last example, this one's my favorite. Oh, okay, so this family is walking along the edge of a cliff. It's a beautiful waterfall. You see that first child slips a little. Everyone's careful and oh my goodness. <laughs> and there's no way that this father has practiced this, right? He's got one child up on his shoulders. He's wearing flip-flops. They're just walking along. And I mean, do you think that, you know, at home they said, okay, you walk along the edge and I'm gonna put on my flip-flops and I'll put your brother up on my shoulders and we're gonna practice this so that just in case you ever are about to fall off the edge, I will know how to catch you. No, of course not. Um, this is something that he just did in that moment. And these are, the, these are examples of what I would like to call rapid psychomotor responses. Um, so these, these kinds of situations can be difficult to uh, reproduce in a laboratory. Um, but so this is where I'm going to argue that these are moments that require actually a lot of thinking. So there was a research group in Canada that was, uh, they are at an institute for studying aging. And so they work specifically with older populations. But they wanted to know, does it require cognitive resources to maintain your posture and your balance? So they asked participants to stand on a platform that would jerk back suddenly. And the participants had three conditions. One was they had to maintain their balance without moving their feet. 
The other one was they could move one foot, but they had to step over an obstacle. And then the other one was they can't move their feet, but they can reach out and grab a railing in order to regain their balance. And they were also wearing all kinds of sensors on their bodies, accelerometers, um, and especially they were wearing sensors that could read the electrical signal from muscles. And what they found was that, uh, okay, so the vertical line P is when the platform starts moving. And if you look at the thing labeled MG, EMG, that was on their, their ankles. And what they found was there was an immediate, almost reflex-like response from the ankles but then the rest of the balance recovery response um, was different based on the situation that they were in. So that immediate response from the ankles happened every single time. But then their, their responses were always taking the greater context into account. Do I need to keep my feet on the platform? Can I step? Do I need to step over this obstacle? Can I reach out? So they, they saw that, OK, so there's a fast response that's the same. And then there's something that seems to be a little slower, but responding to the rest of the environment. So that slower response, could that be using cognition? And so in order to test that, they asked participants to do a mental task, such as counting backwards by threes, or listening to something and telling you which side it is uh, coming from. So they had these these other mental tasks that they had to do at the same time. And this kind of experiment is called a dual task interference. They wanted to know, does it interfere with your posture recovery if you're also doing this mental task? And they found that it did. In both uh, healthy young adults and also in older adults, they found that when they were doing this mental task, they were much slower at recovering their balance. So, we now have the start of a literature that starts to show that these moments where we say, oh, we're just doing, we're not thinking. Actually, those moments, we're doing a lot of thinking. Um, so in general, when you are, okay. So when you are in the real world, back again to the real world, out of the laboratory, um, there are many situations where being able to train your ability to deploy rapid psychomotor response as well would be advantageous. In any chaotic environment, being able to respond very quickly is going to be helpful to you. And so um, I would like to call this kind of practice a rapid psychomotor strategy, or strategia psychomotora rapida. Uh, <laughs> so one example here is a football goalie. So in a football game, the whole point is to try and trick the other team so that your ball can get into the goal, right? And so the last line of defense is a goalie, and a goalie needs to be able to respond to whatever, whatever is happening and to be able to do it quickly uh, so that he can save the ball. So here, this, this goalie is drilling something over and over again, but he has in mind this idea that he's really developing a larger toolkit. So he has all these tools such as, I can move my feet quickly, I can throw my body to one side or the other, but in the actual game, he doesn't know which one he's going to use, but he wants to be able to pick and decide very quickly and know that as soon as he decides, whatever he chooses, it will come out the way he wants it to. Um, another example is uh, emergency medical technicians. So in, in, a, in a medical emergency, it's, uh, kind of implied in the word that you are going into a situation where almost anything could be happening. You don't know what's happening and you need to very quickly assess uh, what is wrong with the patient. And so if you're familiar with this kind of training, you'll see here, they're doing a practical with a, a, uh, an actor as the patient. So this isn't a real patient. Um, and this guy is checking for bleeding in parts of the body where they won't be able to see it right away, but because they don't know whether this guy is hurt because he hurt his head, maybe he's damaged his spine, they don't want to move, uh, they don't want to move him. So they can't turn him over. And so this is, you know, this person is practicing a method for checking for additional injuries in a situation where the person uh, cannot be moved. Uh, and then lastly, other animals also use rapid psychomotor strategies. So here you see that a, a mother cheetah has brought home a baby antelope so that her cubs can practice hunting. 
And obviously, you know, this isn't the same as a real hunt. It's like super beginner level hunting. But this is a way of getting these cubs to understand, oh, well, we've been practicing running and we've been practicing pouncing, but we don't really understand what the context is. Why would we need this and when would we need this? So practicing with this baby antelope gives them the opportunity to understand this is the space of chaos in which we will have to learn to deploy our rapid responses. Um, so something that I just want to mention is that childhood, uh, as these cubs are doing, is a great time to learn rapid psychomotor strategies because you have mentors, parents, teachers who can give you advice, but also you're in a safe space. If you make a mistake, that's totally okay. And in humans, I, I would say university is one of these spaces where we have developed a space for people to try out new ideas, new things, and it's a safe space to do that. Um, so, okay. So now I'm going to go back to what our lab does, which is we want to specifically understand why humans have cortex. Why do we have a cortex? And um, for, for many years, and also in many other labs, uh, in neuroscience, we have spent a lot of energy trying to understand, well, what happens if you don't have a cortex? And it's a bit baffling because uh, in many cases, in many of our laboratory experiments, even if you take away the cortex of an animal, they can still do the task. However, uh, recently my lab mate Gonzalo discovered a situation in which the cortex actually matters. And it is in exactly this thing of deploying a rapid psychomotor response. So um, this video I'm going to show you, these animals need to, um, sorry, I'm just gonna pause real quick. So these animals need to run across these rails and on either side uh, is water for them to drink. Okay, so they are highly motivated to run back and forth, back and forth, and they get very good at running back and forth. And they're very familiar with this environment. But then, what we can do is, these rails, we can release them so that suddenly they'll turn, and they're no longer stable. So this is how we're introducing some kind of unexpected event into their environment. And what we found is that this is exactly the moment where we need a cortex. So in this first one, this is just a normal rat, it runs and then it realizes, oh, there's something different. And so now it's exploring. It changes modes and decides to deploy the exploration uh, response. This one, the rat gets totally scared and is like, oh my god, I don't know what's going on. So it just jumps away. And you'll see it again in slow motion. You see that the unstable, it's unstable again. And so it deploys the runaway fast response. Now this is an animal with no cortex. And it stops, but it's unable to do anything else. It stops and says, okay, something happened, but it, it, it really doesn't know what else to do at that point. So um, it, it, it just gets stuck. It's unable to uh, deploy that rapid psychomotor response. Uh, so um, now I'm, I'm going to talk about the experiment that I did because I was also wanting to, okay, so, um, Cuttlefish don't have cortex, in fact, because they're invertebrates. They have a distributed nervous system. So if we put the cuttlefish into these situations where they are experiencing something unexpected, what do they do? Um, so I created an environment where I thought I could do that. Uh, this is just a, a, a special tank where I present them with uh, a bit of shrimp at the end of a motorized skewer, and I videotape what they do. So this is what the setup looks like inside of the tank room where I was running experiments. And here's a, a brief introduction to the experiment itself. So this is the view from the camera that is above the tank. And so the, the prey is a piece of shrimp on that skewer. It's connected to a motor that I'm controlling so that it will go through some unexpected movements so that the cuttlefish won't be able to predict easily what's gonna happen. And so this is our hunter. This is uh, Sepia officinalis. I named this one Ender. I don't know if you guys know the, the movie or the book Ender's Game. Uh, I named it after a character in that book. Anyways, <laughs> um, because he was the best. Uh, <laughs> so this guy, uh, this is day 10. So um, he has had some experience with the hunting tank. And he knows, kind, he knows that there will be food appearing. He just doesn't know when or how it will move. Um, 
Oh yeah, so the, the GoPro camera gave me a second perspective so that I could also see in color what was going on. And just in case they got really stressed out, I gave them a place to hide and to relax. So that, that's what's going on on this side. Uh, but anyways, Ender is familiar with this, this uh, hunting box. And so you're going to see that he's, he's going to make a catch right away. I'll just give you that right now. Um, so we're going to see, we're going to continue to be able to see the, the prey over there in that corner, but we're going to zoom in on the cuttlefish so that we can get a closer look at what he's doing uh, while hunting. Um, so in the experiment, I gave it a, a, an LED cue, so a light turns on right before the, the prey enters the water. I honestly have no idea yet if they can see that because they don't see color. They only see the polarization of light. But anyways, he notices the shrimp, moves towards it, and cuttlefish have eight arms and two tentacles tucked inside close to their mouth. And what their tentacles do is they push them out slowly like they're aiming it, and then they suddenly throw. You'll see here, it suddenly moves a lot faster. So they release the tentacles, almost like when you uh, are throwing a, a basketball and you, you aim, but then once you throw, it, it's gone, right? You, you can't control it anymore. Um, and then that high contrast pattern that you know, I said that I wanted to study when I first started this experiment, um, that was showing up, and so now I'm characterizing that. But what I realized is that the tentacles aren't actually you know, w once they've aimed and been thrown, it's not done. So this is where I noticed something that might be a rapid psychomotor response in the cuttlefish. And it's much easier to see when they actually miss instead of being successful. So this is Ender again on day 12. Uh, ignore this first one. I don't know why he shot into the corner, um, but he did. And again, you see the high contrast pattern. Um, but so this is day 12, and I've changed the movement of the prey so that it is less predictable once again. So he doesn't know what's going on now. Uh, so this time, on this day, he makes eight misses before he's able to catch the shrimp. And I want you to watch the tips of the tentacles. You'll notice that sometimes the tip will make its own correction. Yeah, like that. Um, when it realizes that it's not going to be close enough to catch the shrimp. And currently, we don't know whether it's there's additional sensors at the tip of the tentacle, or if it's using its eyes and it's saying, last minute change, do it. Or, you know, we, we don't know the mechanism of it, but it's really fascinating to watch how that the, the tips of the tentacles are doing its own kind of correction. And so now what I'm doing is, in addition to looking at that high contrast body pattern, I'm also studying the, the cuttlefish tentacles to understand better what is happening in this situation. Uh, and then I think we'll give it a little more time. He finally makes the catch uh, after eight attempts. So I think this is another miss. Yeah, that one's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how fascinating this is to other people, but I have spent so many hours watching these cuttlefish, and I still, I don't get tired of it. Oh, so I don't know if you guys noticed, but this guy, he aimed for the skewer instead of the shrimp, because he realized that the shrimp is connected to the skewer, and so he started to hunt by, by catching the skewer instead, except what happens is he gets stuck because the, the, the sticky part of the tentacles is not something they can control. So he always gets stuck and he's, he's battling you know, his prey. And what I noticed is that that high contrast pattern stays while he still thinks that the prey is alive and he has to fight it. And so you'll, you'll see he's yanking, yanking, yanking. And then he finally pulls himself free. And as soon as he pulls himself free, you'll notice that that high contrast pattern disappears, but it stays until he's done fighting. So he's going, going, and now, watch, his watch the body pa uh, pattern, it immediately dims down. He's like, I'm done, it's all done. So I'm, I don't know what that pattern is, but it's incredibly fascinating, and so I'm very excited to, to keep looking at my data in order to, to study this. But to go back to what I was saying, um, uh, as the main theme of the talk is these uh, rapid psychomotor responses. That is what is, I think is happening when 
the cuttlefish changes the direction of the tentacle or when the rat encounters a, a loose rail or when a human parent sees their child in danger, these are all moments where we are deploying rapid psychomotor responses. Um, and then I think rapid psychomotor strategies uh, come about when we study the context that surrounds these moments. What kinds of goals or what are the challenges that the environment will give to me when I am pursuing certain kinds of goals? So in other words, the rapid psychomotor strategy is a way to train our ability to pick the correct action uh, in an environment that is changing very rapidly due to a huge number of variables, some of which we know and some of which we don't know. Um, So um, the vast majority of neuroscience right now is done inside of laboratories. And in laboratories, these are environments where we very deliberately try to control and stabilize the environment to make it more predictable, um, which, is, which is a wonderful tool for understanding what the brain can do. But it's less powerful when it comes to trying to understand how the brain chooses what to do, uh, especially under, under duress. So behavior as observed in the movement of bodies, this gives us that full context for what is going on inside of the brain. And the, you know, all of those other techniques that we, I talked about earlier, we have these huge data sets that we've generated of incredibly detailed, high resolution information about brain activity. But in, in the field of neuroscience, there's still a whole lot of controversy and debate over what these signals mean, and it's very difficult to interpret them. And uh, what I believe, and also what my lab believes, and what a growing number of neuroscientists believe, is that if we ever want to interpret those huge data sets that we've collected, we need to have a better understanding of how to study behavior. We need a better descriptive language, we need, we need more theories, and we also need more tools that allow us to do neuroscience in the real world, to go out into the field and to do neuroscience with freely behaving animals who are actually encountering these kinds of events all the time. Um, as, as I said earlier, our brain is incredibly malleable. It'll change based on what our bodies do. So it, it seems only reasonable to assume that the brain of a laboratory-raised animal is going to be significantly different from the brain of a wild animal or the brain of a human, which I think in the end, we're, we're usually trying to understand ourselves. We're a little egotistical like that. Um, but in the end, if we want to understand humans, humans didn't grow up in laboratories. We grow up in the real world where we face these uh, unexpected chaotic situations all the time. And our brains are, uh, uh, are uh, affected by that experience. So if we really want to understand human minds, I think it's very important to start looking at how can we bring neuroscience out into the real world. Um, so understanding neuroscience doesn't, or understanding minds and brains doesn't have to all come from science. Um, I think it can, can come from many places, including uh, art, such as capoeira. And so, um, capoeira <laughs> Thank you. Um, so capoeira is my personal favorite uh, rapid psychomotor strategy. And uh, in, in the capoeira world, uh, meu nome é Sorriso. <laughs> so, uma capoeirista e treino com uh, mandingueiros dos Palmares in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, meu mestre é mestre chuvisco e treino há um ano. Uh, então, uh, tenho uma longa cami uh, caminada pela frente. <laughs> uh, na capoeira, tecnicamente, não existem regras. E um capoeirista tem que jogar e se adaptar uh, a qualquer situação em que seu parceiro o coloca. O objetivo não é somente fluir com seu parceiro e também preciso prestar atenção uh, nos instrumentos e desenvolver seu estilo pessoal de movimento. 
Então, quando treinamos, fazemos com o objetivo de sermos capazes de responder a qualquer coisa em um tempo bem curto, também uh, conhecido como resposta psicomotora rápida. <risos> Enquanto conseguimos responder à música e expressar, expressar o nosso estilo, que tem em conta um contexto maior. A combinação de RPRs neste contexto amplo providencia a base de capoeira como uma estratégia psicomotora rápida. <risos> Muito obrigada. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, I think there is a, a very growing need in neuroscience to collaborate specifically with the psychomotricity community because we have a lot of research and information about the cellular level of things and how things happen inside of a laboratory. But you guys study um, what happens to humans in the real world under these chaotic conditions and so we need to combine our, our information and our resources to really get the full picture. So what I hope is that over the course of this weekend I get to meet as many of you as possible and uh, we can discuss how our two fields can really help each other because I really think that we can. I really think there is uh, a great opportunity for psychomotricity and neuroscience to come together to better understand what minds are doing inside of these bodies that place us in this, this world. Um, so thank you very much. This is uh, my lab and my collaborators and all of the uh, institutions that have made my research possible. And again, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Denvi. <laughs> I think I went over a lot. No, no, no. Okay. You are just in, in time. Um, I just want to uh, make you a question, which is when do we meet again? <laughs> <laughs> I think three days will be short <laughs> well, yeah. for what we have to talk about.